So I want to talk today both a little historically but also about explaining and trying to understand the various ways in which piracy off the coast of Somalia, particularly uh, the kidnap and ransom economy that developed from 2008 to 2012 that attracted a lot of popular interest, media from media portrayals including Hollywood movies like Captain Phillips and and extraordinary tales of ransoms and you know, the hijacking of large uh, oil tankers and such. So I want to try and understand that within both a historical framework of interactions in the Western Indian Ocean amongst a series of empires beginning in the 14th century with the arrival of the 15th century with the arrival of the Portuguese, but also at, with, in relationship to more recent events related to global fisheries as well as things that happened on land and at sea in East Africa and beyond. In order to argue that piracy should be understood as what I call an economy of protection. So the Western Indian Ocean, specifically the shipping lanes of the Gulf of Aden and the Bab al Mandeb, are a crucial component of a multi-trillion dollar global shipping industry. Despite an increasingly virtual era, shipping remains central to world trade, and approximately 80% of global imports and exports currently travel by sea on around 93,000 merchant vessels operated by 1.25 million seafarers carrying six billion tons of cargo, just to give you a sense of the sheer volumes that are at sea. According to the International Maritime Organization, between 22,000 and 25,000 vessels transit through the Suez Canal each year. Every day, 3.3 million barrels of oil are transported from the Bab al Mandeb, representing 30% of the world's oil supply. From 2008 to 2012, a dramatic upsurge in maritime piracy transformed the sea space bringing together a disparate yet interconnected range of actors, from coastal fishermen to insurance adjusters, from livestock to Navy vessels, united by having a role to play in what was called the problem of piracy. Responses to piracy have included the deployment of multinational naval patrols, the prosecution of suspected pirates in jurisdictions across the globe, and increasingly, the use of private security companies escorting ships transiting through the Gulf of Aden. In general, piracy has been seen as the maritime ripple effect of anarchy on land, a law and order pro a problem stemming from the absence of centralized government in Somalia. For example, the journalist Robert Kaplan writes, Somalia is a failed state with a long coastline, so piracy flourishes nearby, as it does offshore, <coughs> in other weakly governed states like Indonesia and Nigeria. For Kaplan and many others, the Gulf of Aden might as well be a street to Mogadishu. Even accounts that focus on problems of overfishing and toxic dumping in Somali waters locate piracy squarely on the absence of a centralized government. As an African Union maritime expert in Addis Ababa told me, piracy is just the symptom. The real problem is the lack of government. The equation in all these accounts is that in order to understand this, we need to understand the fact that there is no state in Somalia. Pirates thrive due to the absence of a centralized government. Without denying the real purchase of this framing and the hardship that many Somalis have incurred over 20 years of statelessness, my work wants to push back at this equation between failed states and piracy in order to historically and ethnographically render a different understanding of what piracy entails. I argue instead that thinking of piracy as an economy of protection better explains its standing in the Western Indian Ocean. My understanding of protection emerges from this historical and contemporary archive and is best described as simultaneously a claim to taxation, a form of work, and a mode of exercising jurisdiction. I suggest that maritime piracy, and specifically the kidnap and ransom economy that developed from 2008 onwards, is a system of protection that has longer histories in the Red Sea and the Western Indian Ocean and also goes beyond piracy. Protection thus offers an alternative view into the intertwined processes of law and economic practice and to move beyond certain dichotomies that we have of state and non-state, legal and illegal, that frame engagements and contests over governments, profits and mobility in this space. So begin in some ways 
at the end today. By 2012, the golden age of piracy had for many ended. From its heyday between 2007 and 2011, a period in which over 150 ships and some 3,400 crew members were held hostage, incidents of maritime piracy, successful or otherwise, plummeted by 80%. Sensing these shifting currents in January 2013, the notorious pirate boss Muhammad Abdi Hassan, also known as Ahwain, which is a big mouth, announced his retirement at a press conference in Hartford, <laughs> an infamous pirate port in the Muduk region of central Somalia. Afwain's group, the Central Somali Piracy Network, was alleged to be responsible for a number of high-profile hijackings, including the capture of the Saudi oil tanker, the Sirius Star, in 2007, the largest ship ever to be hijacked. Surrounded by members of the local government and a number of business and religious elites, Afwain announced that he had rethought the ethics of what he termed as the dirty business and was retiring from piracy. Within a few months of his retirement, he was traveling around central Somalia with a letter from the Galmudu government stating his new position as an anti-piracy protection officer. In an interview with the local radio station, he explained that he wanted to protect Somalis from the scourge of piracy and bring in revenue to develop a port city in the Muduk region of central Somalia. In the latest twist to this story, in October 2013, the Belgian government announced that they had arrested Afwain as he landed in Brussels, lured by the fake promise to become a consultant for a documentary on Somali piracy. Afwain is currently under trial, and this would be the first attempt at prosecution of a sort of self styled pirate boss, because usually most prosecutions have been of those who were interdicted at sea. And, and often one of the critiques of that was that these are essentially the foot soldiers. You know, these are not the people who in fact even profit from piracy. The ones who do are sitting in Somalia. So this is part of a shift of moving towards trying to go higher up in the kind of hierarchy of piracy and do these legal prosecutions. But I want to think about Afwain's unsuccessful attempt at transforming himself from pirate to counter-piracy officer. Because this follows in a long tradition of those who are called pirates as slippery shapeshifters who move between worlds of licit and illicit, confusing and confounding these categories. In the early, Atlant in the early modern Atlantic world, where inter-imperial rivalries continued onto the high seas, documents such as the Letter of Mark were often the only distinction between an act of piracy and a legitimate form of plunder or reprisal. The cyclical nature of war and peace in the Atlantic and later the Indian Ocean, as empires jostled and competed for influence and profit, led to a steady ebb and flow between pirate and privateer. In times of war, the demand for privateers surged, and during peace, privateers were decommissioned, and if they continued engaging in raiding without sponsorship, they became pirates. So this is part of a longer history of thinking of how we define where piracy is and where piracy ends. And Afwain, in that sense, I want to locate this idea of retirement and an attempt to move beyond piracy. It's part of a longer history of how this practice has been understood. Some did it very successfully in the Atlantic, becoming governors and, and others. And I think we'll talk about that later. But, but in, in the Somali context, too, there is this attempt to move, you know, to think of piracy as a temporary form of work and often described as work, hence Afwain talked of it as he's retiring from this business. So I want to kind of move now back to the Western Indian Ocean and sort of thinking about a longer history of this practice, particularly to highlight how piracy is tied to certain understandings of legitimate and illegitimate violence and ideas of political authority and sovereignty in this region. So from Mogadishu to Malacca, the world of the Indian Ocean was connected through a series of exchanges from the, by the 15th century, creating what Lila Gulagut has called the earliest trans-regional world economy. By the 15th century, coastal East Africa was intimately tied, and that's where I talk mostly about sort of this part of the world and its connections to the rest of the Indian Ocean. So coastal East Africa was tied to this wider Indian Ocean economy through the exchange of cotton cloth from India and glass beads from East Africa. A series of coastal towns from Berbera to Kilva were the fulcrum around which this trade was organized. 
As scholars of these trading networks have pointed out, long distance trade was not only about the movement of goods, but also through this, the building of social, cultural, and kinship ties that stretched across the ocean, creating what can be understood as a domestic space of interaction across this oceanic realm. So the reason for this mobility and the creation of an Indian Ocean cosmopolitanism is both mundane and sacred. At one level, until the coming of steam, things in the Indian Ocean moved at a monsoonal pace. Arriving in a port city often meant more than just unloading and loading cargo and moving on. One arrived to stay for the season and wait for the winds to turn. Given this, merchants established homes, families, and deep-rooted interests in the ports they traversed to year after year. Secondly, this movement was organized not by a state, but by a world religion, Islam, that was universal but deeply inflicted within the local. Through pilgrimage, genealogy, and the transmission of various Islamic texts, places across the ocean were tied together in a string of domesticity and kinship, allowing for forms of mobility and creolization across this space. This does not mean that this world was free of violence or other forms of taking that can be understood as piracy. Challenging previously held views, scholars such as Patricia Riso, Gwen Campbell, and Sebastian Prang have sought to critique a view of Indian Ocean as simply an area of free, unrestricted trade. So, you know, people have highlighted the ways that they were raiding communities that essentially was dependent on the sea. And to also think of you know, what the nature of these communities was to the political. Part of the reason why the Indian Ocean is often seen as lacking piracy in the sort of classic sense is because, as Sebastian Prank notes, that the, the key criterion by which piracy was evaluated was a certain form of organization. And by this measure, historians have found Asian piracy wanting in comparison to the quality of maritime violence described to the European actors. As a result, Indian Ocean pirates were portrayed as pests rather than political actors. So in his work and others, including mine, I try to understand this relationship between politics and economy. And, and also the ways that maritime commerce, violence, and state building in, throughout the Indian Ocean world are intimately related, if different from other oceanic spaces. And one of the questions that, begin, that then comes is how do we understand the various colonial encounters that happened in this oceanic space? So I want to go back to this idea of protection and think of the <laughs> European encounter of the Indian Ocean as not necessarily a moment of rupture, but rather a contest between different regimes of protection. I turn now to a tale of Portuguese arrival and how the division between legitimate and illegitimate commerce was a central framework through which to understand these oceanic encounters. In 1498, Vasco da Gama, with the assistance from a mysterious local navigator, variously claimed by coastal communities from Malindi to Malabar and by Muslims, Christians, and Jews, marked the beginning, you know, rounded the Cape of Good Hope and entered the Indian Ocean, marking the beginning of a truly global economy, connecting this trans-regional Indian Ocean trade network to the world of the Atlantic. As Aang Seng Ho, the historian and anthropologist Aang Seng Ho has noted, viewed from the vantage point of the Portuguese boat, what was strange about this world of the Indian Ocean was that no one state controlled it or even had an idea of doing so. Pre-colonial empires in Asia and Africa focused on revenue collection on land and did little to interfere with maritime raid, or trade, but as I highlighted earlier, this didn't mean an absence of violence, just a different vision of how the sea was conceptualized. The Portuguese, with the scientific geographers assembled by Prince Henry the Navigator, were the first to think of this oceanic space as a unity and dream of a way to monopolize the terms through which trade worked in this space. Portuguese motto in the Indian Ocean can best be described as trade when possible, plunder when necessary. And plunder became a fairly common occurrence as the Portuguese sought to develop this monopoly over mobility by capturing key ports and issuing cartazes, which were special shipping permits. So they brought to this ocean principles of extraterritorial sovereignty and created and policed distinctions between licensed and unlicensed. If you possessed a cartaz, you were merchant ship. If you did not, you were a pirate. The Portuguese venture was ultimately unsuccessful as they failed to capture Aden and thus control access to the Red Sea. 
Nonetheless, they marked a shift that continues to this day of transforming the ocean from this prior space of movement to a unity, to a, to a space that has to be controlled. So it's where key choke points emerge as a way of controlling movement within the space. So contemporary counter piracy with American and other warships that are patrolling the Gulf of Aden today, in that sense are legacies of these longer histories of encounter between multiple regimes of protection. But protection was never merely an economic practice. Accusations of pirate, slaver, and mercantilist are deeply contested moral categories and were central to the rationale of protection costs. As the theorist Charles Tilly has noted in his provocative rereading of the rise of the European nation state, the word protection has two tones. One is comforting and the other threatening. With one tone, protection calls up images of shelter. With the other, it evokes the racket in which a local strongman forces merchants to pay tribute in order to deliver. In addition, logics of protection were never one-way positions. Along the East African coast, literal populations both contested and cooperated with these shifting currents, as I'll illustrate now with a brief example from the Somali coast. These encounters were productive in shaping new forms of how people related to each other. And I want to now turn rapidly to the 19th century and to the northern Somali coast, which is where I did my research. And in some ways, with the beginning of the Suez Canal, this region where the Red Sea meets the Indian Ocean all of a sudden becomes increasingly important. So you have a whole degree of imperial interest and also an increase in shipping. At the same time, as one leaves the Red Sea to the Indian Ocean, as you can see, the Somali current produces a whirlpool. And by the 1820s, 1830s, there were at least three to four ships that would be, that would just run aground. And as that happened, a whole salvage economy developed in this region, where nearby residents would converge on the site, capture, and loot vessels. These practices were understood as variations on a long-standing mode among clans, primarily along clan and uh, primarily along livestock trading routes. Known as Aban in Somalia, the practice of offering escort in return for payment is a wider regional mode of engaging with the outside world. As the historian Lee Casinelli notes, each clan required some access to major nodes and arteries of commercial exchange. Each guarded its rights to oversee this as jealously as it guarded home bells and reserve grazing. So location became a way of inserting oneself in this world of trade. On land, it meant charging a sort of protection fee as, as caravan traders traveled through. At sea, it meant the rescue and sort of return in, uh, in, you know, in exchange for payment for these salvage economies. So as the Majritin developed this practice at sea, they also were able to create this, they were able to centralize power. And those who could control the, the proceeds and the selling of these ships transformed themselves into sultanates. Sultan, so the Majritin Sultanate emerges in the 1820s, 1830s in northern Somalia as a result of this shipwreck economy. And this becomes a way for them when the British and later Italian come to claim to claim recognition and say, okay, we are the protectors of, of shipping at this coast. Of course, the British and Italians did not see them necessarily as protectors. They were seen as pirates. And drawing on laws of shipwrecks that distinguish between flotsam and jetsam and their duty to protect free trade, the British blockaded the ports of Bosasso and Berbera in the north, eventually signing treaties of protection with the Mesherteen institutionalizing their claims as protectors by offering payment for rescue and salvage. So as we see, these contests over property protection and piracy were the ways in which Somalis and Europeans encountered each other in the early 19th century, prior to the sort of rise of official colonialism in this area and colonial incorporation. This is, of course, a wider oceanic story, and various port cities across the Indian Ocean, especially those that inhabited major choke points of trade, like the Bab al Mandeb and the Straits of Malacca, constantly vied with each other through promises of protection and guarantees of legality. Somali piracy and the ongoing rush to build exclusive economic zones and free ports throughout the Indian Ocean, thus, is part of this wider story and can be linked to 
longer ways of transforming protection, the protection of piracy into more enduring and durable forms. In addition to highlighting this slippage, this long history of slippage between legality and illegality, and locating Somali piracy within wider projects of transforming protection into profit and political authority, a story that resonates with how a number of scholars have thought of the rise of European states. I want to focus now on the specificity of Somali piracy as an economy of protection and highlight its both sort of zoom in to the local, but also highlight its relationship to a wider world of global fisheries. And so to think about this space through the, the image of the sea, not only as a space of trade, but also as a space of resources that then are harnessed and, and attempted to, and contests over who they belong to. What we do is different, Hassan said. In Asia, they make cold ships disappear. In Africa, he meant West Africa, they steal fuel. We just catch fish. Hassan was explaining to me the uniqueness of Somali piracy, a uniqueness that made this practice permissible in his mind and distinct from theft. While minimizing the forms of violence that constitute the act of hijacking and taking over ships, this analogy of fish and ships gives important insights into the origins, transformations, and afterlives of piracy in this region. And for the remainder of the talk, I focus on this specific relationship through the idea of capture. While possessing one of the longest coastlines as continental Africa and some of the richest fisheries off its coast, Fish and fishing in Somalia have historically been marginal to its livestock and agricultural counterparts. So, and this is one of the, in some ways, the great irony of this is because of the Somali current, you have uh, what's an upwell that's created that ends up producing one of the most fertile sort of grounds for fishing, and, and primarily tuna, yellow tail, uh, yellow tail snapper, other kinds of fish that increasingly, especially as a global you know, desires, global desires changed around fish, these kinds of fish became central to how we consume fish in the world. So the, the sort of popularization of sushi around the world has an impact in that this coast all of a sudden becomes very important. Most Somalis do not like tuna. So there's also this, uh, this strange way in which these coastal fishermen who were incredibly marginal all of a sudden at some point in the 70s, 80s, found themselves having you know, at their doorstep this very large, lucrative form of fishing. And before sort of turning to that transformation that began in the 1970s, I want to just take a minute to just put up some numbers about global fisheries and you know, just the sheer value of this resource and the number of livelihoods that are connected both directly and indirectly on it and particularly this idea. Right? So this is a story both of consumption as well as it is about production and contests that happen at sea. This is about how ideas of you know, what kind of seafood we eat and what we want matter in the sense that they have these repercussions in parts of the world that we don't necessarily see of as related. So, so, in that, you know, so there's global consumption increased and levels of fish catch have been remain relatively stable. One of the ways in which the increase of fishing has led to the, also the transformation of technologies at sea, including the development of what is called bottom trawling, which is essentially where you have large nets and a ship will go at about <coughs> four knots, four nautical miles an hour, and then just drag along, as you can see here, and it essentially bulldozes the sea floor damaging not only coral reefs, but also other bottom-dwelling life that most of us don't consume. So, and these nets you know, can weigh up to five tons, carry most of it is what is called bycatch, which is things that are not used. And they are, they've been banned in a number of places, but of course, this is one of the most common ways of entering Somali waters, is through these nets. So going back to Somalia, during the heydays of scientific socialism in 1960s and 70s, the then president Siad Bare sought to transform the ocean from a space of trade and connectivity to one of profit, property, and extraction. 
1972, the government decreed in law number 37 on the territorial sea that Somalia's territorial sea extended 200 nautical miles as opposed to the traditional designation of 12 nautical miles. This move was followed by the launch, primarily through Soviet assistance, of a deep sea trawling fleet and the construction of fish factories and processing plants along the coast. Additionally, Siadbare sought to transform common perceptions of fish and fisheries through radio messages and other forms of public outreach, including posters, some of which still survive, and popular songs on the virtues of eating fish. The drought of 1974 gave further impetus to this project. A major counter-drought relief measure was the development of Soviet and later Italian-aided resettlement programs, including coastal fishing cooperatives for pastoralists from the heavily affected Ogaden region. So the replacement of people, the displacement of people from this region, and this is in Ethiopia, and to Ail, to Hobio, Jawahar, Mogadishu, Mecca, and the creation of various kinds of fishing cooperatives. So these settlements attempted with Soviet, Italian, and later Australian capital and advisors to transform pastoralists into fishermen and create a vibrant fishing sector. By most accounts, this attempt to create the fishing sector was a failure. As the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN reported, <coughs> You know, in the 1970s, there were about 500 mechanized boats operating on this coast, and the annual catch increased from 5,000 tons to a peak of 8,000 tons. However, due to lack of maintenance and spare parts, the report goes on to highlight, and that these new boats had been distributed to fishermen, so the original people who were given the boats would lease these out. About two-thirds of these boats were out of operation after only two years, and as a direct consequence, by the late 1970s, annual fish production was back to 5,000 tons. Additionally, fishing still retained a marginal status within the diet of most Somalis, so most of the fish became an export commodity, which meant that creating a pattern of licensing and concession, because this was also the time when the development of large ocean-going fishing trawlers emerged who end up spending at almost sometimes years at sea. And there have been recent reports, in primarily in the New York Times, about some of the conditions on these ships, primarily Thai and Korean, and the kinds of labor practices that happened here. So this is, in, and this begins in some ways in the 1970s, 1980s, and you have this movement with the Convention on the Law of the Seas that ended up creating exclusive economic zones and marking that dis uh, distinction between exclusive economic zones and territorial seas. So what happened was coastal states that did not have the ability, so in the convention, the coastal states that don't have the ability to harness the sea, according to a formula that has been debated by a number of scientists because fish are highly mobile, so it's very difficult to say, this person, you can take this much fish out of the water every year. So, but if coastal states weren't able to harness up to that maximum sustainable yield, they had to lease out their exclusive economic zone. So which is why states like Seychelles and Mauritius have large French shipping, uh, fishing companies that have essentially monopolized that sea space. And similar story happened in Somalia. So by the 1980s, most of what, who, the people who were fishing in terms of industrial fishing were large-scale trawlers that were coming from outside that had licenses that were paying for these licenses. Somali fishermen would often work alongside these foreign fishing fleets in order to protect trawlers <coughs> and police the de facto enclosures of the sea. Because their boats, their fishing techniques were no match for this, so they ended up having no role as fishermen in that moment, but rather as essentially security guards for these fishing boats. The village of Benderbela was one of the first sites for this system to develop, and it's actually right here, which is where I spent uh, most of my time, uh, along with Bosasu. And, you know, and I have some interviews from there where people explained how this process developed with the state-backed Somali fishing company, or Songfish. So Mohamed Harshi, one of the elders of the fishing community, explained, when some fish wanted to fish near our village, they agreed to pay us $1,000 a month, so we stayed out of their way. 
They also hired a number of men from here to give protection to these trawlers and make sure that no other vessels came into the area. Most of the time, we just kept the area free from fishermen from Bosaso or other places along the coast. Villagers recalled that the trawlers that began to arrive from other countries in 18, in, from the 1986 through 1990 no longer paid these fees or taxes. While most of the vessels stayed away from the coast or were chased away by these protection group, many interviewees pointed to Norwegian trawlers as primarily attempting to bypass these protection deals. A number of these trawlers had licenses from the regime in Mogadishu or even at this point gave up because this is simultaneously the state is weakening its hold in the late 1980s, 1990s. So there, so there's, uh, so some, you had the emergence of just fishing trawlers coming in, fishing, there was no Somali Coast Guard and the Somali Navy at this point had basically just dwindled. And this was never a harmonious system, or certainly not one geared towards sustainability or benefit for Somali fishermen. Interviewees recall violent confrontation between these protection groups and foreign fishing vessels, <coughs> especially those that attempted to fish without official or unofficial licenses. In addition, foreign trawlers, especially those using bottom trawling techniques, greatly harmed local fishing grounds and impacted the artisanal fishing communities along the coast. As global appetites for seafood, especially tuna, increased, alongside a greater mode of regulation in the Pacific and the Atlantic, the Western Indian Ocean saw the arrival of numerous foreign fishing fleets that attempted to adapt into the system of protection and capture that was developing along the Somali coast. The collapse of the state, then, was not a moment of rupture, but rather the privatization of these licensing regimes the emergence of sub-state entities like Puntland in the 1990s also contributed to this privatization by trying to channel the revenue of the sea. So from the 1990s, we also have the emergence in Somalia of, I mean, we think of it as statelessness, but rather it was the emergence of sub-state kind of entities all along the coast, Somaliland, Puntland being the two primary ones. And one of the ways that the, um, the sort of you know, the emerging elite in Puntland attempted to raise revenue was through creating this fish licensing system. So this became, alongside taxes at the port of Bosaso, the second most way of getting revenue to create a state-like entity. So even though at its heyday, you know, so in that sense, and also what happens as this does is that in the 1990s you have just sort of lots of local communities emerging and saying that no, we are, we are in fact the true protectors, not these guys over there, so you have to pay us. So there's an increase in violence uh, and then capture as opposed to exchange becomes the idiom of engagement at sea from the 1990s onwards with the rise and fall of various Coast Guard initiatives, some of which were funded by the UN and the US and other protection schemes. And we see the gradual scaling up from fish to fishing vessels from cargo ships to oil tankers. So this is how I want to think about this history of recent piracy is, is this attempt that is moving up from contests over fishing vessels, initially contests over fish, to fishing vessels, to cargo ships, and then to these spectacular forms of capture. So here are some pictures from some of the fishing communities in northern Somalia. This is the port of Posaso. Some, and these are actually um, mostly Yemeni fishing boats that were there. These are the older fishing trawlers that basically are left to rust. And now we return back to piracy. Even though it's in its heyday, contemporary piracy was unrecognizable from its earlier modes in scale, in terms of ransom. As this economy transformed from catching fish, the Kobzo Kalum, as it was called in Somali, to Kabzo Meili, the ship. Catch, capture was still how this act of boarding and hijacking is narrated for those involved in this world. As Ali, a former pirate, explained, we look for ships that are heavy, that have low freeboard. When you see a ship like that, we try and get alongside it, but are careful not to get caught in its wake. After that, you throw up ladders and ropes Everyone has a role. The first person who climbs aboard is in the most danger. He is going to make sure no one is armed 
and that is why he gets an extra reward. After that, four to six people get aboard, find the crew, and start leading the ship back to Somalia. So these are some of the villages where piracy sort of emerged. At this point, so the ships, and you can see sort of in the distance, there are, there's a, there are a few boats that had been hijacked that were kept. And, one, and that's one of the things along the coast, because it was a ransom economy, because it was unclear how long these ransoms would take, there were these boats that would always sort of exist at the edge of the horizon. And one knew that you know, there was this whole negotiation and transaction happening over it. And capture begins a whole set of transactions, and primarily debt and credit relationships. Ships are anchored just offshore in cell phone range, and hostages and hijackers sh share a strange sort of domesticity in the weeks and sometimes years it took for negotiations to transpire. Guards and hostages are not allowed to leave the ship, and food, water, and cap were brought in daily. We wait before we catch a ship, said one hijacker, and we wait afterward. Waiting is not a time between work, but an integral part of this world of piracy. As guards wait, they chew, they eat food, they drink water, they use cell phone airtime to buy a variety of goods. Debt and payment obligations are constructed in this moment of waiting, as networks of investors, entrepreneurs, delinquents, and pirates <coughs> emerge while waiting for the ransom. Negotiations over ransoms also bring into view insurance companies, and in the larger book project, I look at how private securities, navies, insurance companies also become sort of central to uh, thinking through this idea of waiting and the economy of piracy. So piracy is not just the story of this hijacking of ships, but also uh, the way in which the ocean becomes a different space, the way in which insurance companies, in fact, profit from it. And it also highlights the sort of racial and class logics of global shipping. Certain hostages are worth more than others. And allows us to see these slippages between licit and illicit. And also how people become valued and not valued within a wider global economy. So, and one of the things that piracy also does, uh, a sort of result of what happened as a result of piracy, was the creation of a different very legal economy, as ships stopped going to Somalia along the coast of Western India and Pakistan, these older wooden boats that were called bows, sailing vessels, were re-outfitted. They were expanded, they became bigger, and they became the boats that were willing to either take the risk or had the ability to move between S South Asia. So, so an older kind of you know, trade route almost re-emerged with piracy with the beginning of going from South Asia to Dubai and to Somalia, something that had been replaced by airplanes and you know you have traders and merchants who would just take the flight to Dubai and now all of a sudden things were going back through sea. So I worked with this economy as well. I went to West India and you can see so piracy meant booms in different places. It meant a boom in London in the insurance markets. It also meant a boom for these shipping economies and you can see this sort of scale of these are not wooden sailing vessels in the traditional sense. They are essentially small container ships at this point. And there's a whole host of goods that get carried on them, from dental chairs to cars to pink limousines. <laughs> and then one arrives in Somalia, this port and this port of Osasso, and, and one waits again. So the long so there is a whole way in which waiting is central to the world of being at sea and also being on land and the unloading of goods. And this, is, you know, and this happens amidst an increased militarization of the space. So we have the emergence of that fish, uh, the shipping economy, but also insurance markets transform. And one of the ways they transformed was creating what is called the Western Indian Ocean war risk cover. This essentially means that shippers are charged an extra fee often 0.5 to 1% for transiting through this. So instead of taking out a standard hulled machinery insurance contract, you, as soon as you enter this area, you have to cancel that, but you take a, long, you take a different insurance contract. And the cost, I would initially wonder why people were so upset about it. And they would say, you know, it's about 0.5, 1, or 
of the ship's value, which if you think about how much container ships cost, especially oil tankers, that is a significant amount per voyage. So insurance companies certainly were you know, using that profit, but this is also a variable form of insurance. So unlike standard actuarial practices, which are based on numbers, this in creating risk profiles for larger groups, this is per ship. So it matters if you hire a private security contractor, if you hire, all, if you are willing to have satellite technology that the shipping company recommends. So it creates this ancillary economy. So in the same way that an economy of piracy, in order to keep hostages alive, in order to keep you know, neg negotiators emerged in Somalia, as did translators and suppliers in the same way in this global economy of counter piracy we have the emergence of private security contractors negotiators ransom droppers so south african bush pilots who would drop ransoms onto ships so there is this emergence of piracy is not just a form of taking but also a kind of emergence of various kinds of economies and their intersections at sea Piracy as an economy of protection structured in idioms of capture, then, is not only a form of channeling and interrupting global trade, but a site to understand encounter between multiple regimes and actors that are re reshaping the Indian Ocean beyond space of transit. Far from an anachronistic practice or a byproduct of state failure, piracy highlights the centrality of protection and the latent and not so latent forms of violence that are often central to making things move. Making visible this world that of mobility and its breakdown, including the productivity of interruption, is a vantage point, I argue, onto the histories and futures of what we understand as global capitalism, including the violence, regulation, and labor that is at the heart of these forms of accumulation, exchange, and redistribution. Thank you. And these questions continue in certain ways as there's a return of fishing trawlers now, and I'd be happy to talk more about where things stand. So, questions? We have time for questions. So. Um, I, I don't suppose the, the pirates claim a certain offshore limit, but what does the Somalian government claim? How many miles offshore uh, so, would be uh, Somalian waters? <laughs> so there still is the... Um, because the law of 1972 on territorial waters still says that Somali waters extend to 200 nautical miles, which is not recognized by the UN law of the seas. But but this is going. This is currently being debated at the um, International Arbitration for Maritime Disputes in Germany, because the, there has been offshore oil. So there are there are reserves that have been sort of found, or at least projected. And both Kenya and Somalia claim them, and so the Kenyan government has taken the Somali government to court, to this arbitration panel, where they, we will finally, I guess, get a clarification on what that, you know, what that coastline is, and what the sort of territorial sea or the exclusive economic zone of Somalia is. And international law is what, 12? So international law is 12, and then a 200-mile exclusive economic zone. But it depends on the seabed. So it also is based on how, where the seabed is, and that mapping hasn't been done for the Somali coast. So, so you would have to essentially remap the seabed and then go 12 miles out, and then 200 miles into the exclusive economic zone. Yeah, just two comments real quick. First of all, thank you. Your comments were really fascinating. I learned a lot from them, and uh, I had a flashback there. Um, a similar kind of uh, uh, protection economy. I used to be in the, in the Army, and we used to go to El Paso, Texas for school quite often, the branch I was in. And we would go to Mexico quite often to shop and eat dinner, stuff like that. And, and you know, it wasn't anything official, but people would just pass down stories. When you went over there and parked your car, there'd be young adults patrolling the parking lots. And you were expected to pay a couple bucks. You know, you just kind of learned this unofficially. And they would watch your car. And they wouldn't take the money and run. They wouldn't take the money and mess up your car. They would actually do a great job of watching your vehicle while you were doing whatever. Um, so that was kind of a related thing. Another question about this. So one photo you showed several slides ago. There were quite a few ships sitting right offshore. Mm -hmm. And most of us here, you know, we, we, we were the 07 to 11, the big period. And we all remember the big stories, the big ships that were taken, the Captain right. Phillips, things like that. But is there any data? It's hundreds. How many? It, I, there's no exact number, but how many ships were 
pirated in that four or five year time frame, hundreds, thousands, it seems like there were a lot of black dots sitting in the right. water off, and that was just one photograph of one small portion of the shoreline. Mm -hmm. And I was totally unaware of, of that number of ships that were taken and held, and the pink limousines and things being taken. Any date on the total number stopped? It's, it's highly, I mean, it's in part in terms of because oftentimes, I mean, there are most of the sh larger shipping companies do report when acts of piracy happen. Oftentimes, smaller boats, especially the ones that they, these these thousands, if they were ever taken, there was both a different way in which negotiations would work. Oftentimes, these thousands are owned by you know, or jointly owned between South Asian and Somali merchants, so they would have their networks that they would call on, and this was methodologically how I had access to this world, was through knowing a number of these Tao captains and traders, and so through them talking to people who were involved in piracy. But, but they, there's no place where they necessarily report what happens, and a lot of larger cargo companies also don't, because they don't want to you know, have to then do a full accounting for that. And so, so there are, it's, I mean, the official figures are still somewhere about 200 ships, but that doesn't include smaller boats, fishing trawlers, and there were a couple Spanish trawlers that were taken, and I remember at that point I was in Djibouti interviewing the EU, and they said that you know, they knew about it, but they weren't going to write about it because that would, perpetu that would bring the idea that the navies were there protecting foreign fishing fleets, and they were nervous about the kind of press that that would get because they were ostensibly. So one of the things that happened in with the rise of piracy was for the last few years there has been very little sort of trawling off the coast and fish numbers were high, fish like just local pe people in the markets would talk about just this increase in fishing and that has changed. So as numbers of pirates have plummeted, the fishing trawlers have come back and there's in some ways we were kind of back at that cycle of the 1980s where now it's mostly trawling that's going on and when things happen with trawlers no one hears about it. In the, in the general mix, uh, it's um, corporate social responsibility or governmental uh, policy, government policy specific, specific to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. Is it a factor in inducing piracy in making Delta region in Nigeria? Like, um, is it considered a factor in the NCS? In terms of uh, in terms of inducing, you know, like, there have been a lot of emails, a lot of uh, right. cases, like, mm -hmm. different regions of Nigeria. Is it considered a factor? And can you can you can the same extend it to tsunami? I think the Nigerian context is somewhat different, and even those who were involved in Somalia, like that interview where I had saying, you know, in, in Southeast Asia, you make ships disappear, which is called ghosting. This practice, when ships will go into port, they will rewrite the registration number, and then you have essentially a cargo ship that is off the books. And, and also in Southeast Asia, primarily a lot of it is container theft. So you have containers disappearing. Part of it is a larger infrastructure, very different geography, it's more archipelagos, and Nigeria, as far as my understanding, is, is tied to Delta politics and questions around access, who has rights to revenues from oil, so you have a lot of oil bunkering, and, and that has complicity with the government, you know, government officials involved in it as much as others. So what was unique about Somali piracy was that it was is a sort of kidnap and ransom on crew members. There was, so even when the Sirius Star was hijacked that had about a billion dollars worth of oil on it, none of the oil was touched, which would not happen in the, in the Delta and the Gulf of Guinea. So I think there, there is a difference in both modes of operation, which also highlights the longer histories through which these practices are understood. So I see the Nigerian one as a kind of insurgency at sea. Whereas in Somalia, I see it more as part of this history of where the lines between who has rights to claim payment for protection come in. And that is part of a longer practice in the Indian Ocean. Can I just go there? Did you encounter any arms trade with those fishermen on these boats during your research? 
Hey, that's one of so, so in terms of these boats or the fishing fishing trawler? uh, I, the fishing trawlers were one of this. the most dangerous but like they were people that did not want to talk to me in part because they you know they often they are very very of Greenpeace and a whole host of you know NGO actors who are documented because there has been yeah. a move including the recent New York Times piece on it there's been moves to try and document just this world of illegal under what is called illegal unreported fishing and which has led to incredible amounts of violence and, and so in some ways that economy is far more dangerous to act so I I only encountered it from a distance I interviewed some NGOs who had done research on it I went to I was, when I was in Djibouti, there's the fishing port, and but the fishermen that I talked to were mostly local fishermen, so most of my experience was their encounters with these travelers. And so I didn't hear about arms trade, but there is, of course, there is a technically an arms embargo in Somalia under the UN Security Council resolution, but Somalia is also one of the most heavily armed countries. Most of that comes from Yemen, yeah. and it comes by sea, yeah. Me? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm somewhat interested in Indonesia, and Indonesia's last two presidents have been fairly reform-minded. Are you finding uh, piracy, uh, piracy diminishing around those waters? And if it is, is it through efforts of the Indonesian government? So the, in, uh, there was a period of decline, and there has now been a fairly large uptick in incident. So now that Somalia is no longer the sort of epicenter for piracy, the International Maritime Bureau and the IMO talk of the, I think, you know, if we go back to this map, the Straits of Malacca are also part of a war escarpment. Right? So they, they continue to be, so if you look at this, you have the Gulf of Guinea here, Western Indian Ocean, and the Straits of Malacca that are war escarpments. Um, Indonesia was able to, what it, why one of the reasons why piracy declined in the 1990s and early 2000s was part of these regional cooperation networks that were created in Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and you don't have that, both because of geography, and if you think about how hard it would be to police these waters as opposed to archipelago, which is much more narrower, and most of that is territorial waters. So, but at the same time, there, there, which also means that it's easier to you know, make ships disappear in these waters as well. So, so I think in the Indonesian case is more about this question of the limits of regional governance and regional regulation, because there, ASEAN and all those are entities are very strong, and in attempting to keep a hold of their sovereignty, because they recognize also that. <laughs> piracy is an intern the piracy as an international crime makes it possible for a whole host of navies and other vessels to come at sea and patrol their waters which they don't want. And that's one of the things that a number of people would point out and say, you know sort of piracy allows the US, the EU, but also China, Iran, India, Thailand and other countries to keep a naval presence at sea in, and increasingly as Africa and its connection to Asia, the South-South world becomes more important to these kinds of networks. Piracy, counter piracy became a way of countries to say we matter and, and in that sense, so this was as much symbolic as it was actually you know, trying to curb acts of piracy. Whereas in Indonesia, there's very much an awareness that we don't want, we, we want our territorial waters to remain our territorial waters. It's, it's fascinating that you spent time with people who are somewhat closely associated with piracy. You don't meet many people who have that kind of day-to-day -day interaction in your research. And I guess we as educators would find it interesting here. Do you have any particular anecdotes you can share? Maybe the, uh, the, the family structure, the cultural day-to-day -day lives that the, these people and their families would have. It's kind of tied in also that the number of Westerners would associate, would, would conclude that the, the motivation to go to pi piracy would be out of economic desperation, that either your family structure, your, your ability to be self-sufficient economically has been lost, so you turn to that. But 
Uh, this is sort of a two-pronged question. Though. Right. So in terms of, I'll start with the second one. One of the things to note and remember is that piracy was, you know, at, at, even at its peak, there were more people, I think, involved in the movement of livestock from the interior of Somalia to Yemen than there were in piracy. Part of that had to do with a strong recognition of, or discomfort with the sort of morality of this practice. So there was, there were lots of debates amongst, in these communities on whether it was okay to be a pirate and you know, what, what it meant to be a pirate. And of course, these, you know, is raiding something that is permissible in Islam. And, and they would sort of go back through, you know, think about well, what, what is this, what are we in fact doing? And, and some would say, well, this is a temporary act. So Afwain and others who said, you know, we will retire. I think it's easy to read that as very cynical, like this was just a recognition that piracy is not profitable. But I think there is, there is a lot to the fact that not everyone became a pirate, even though initially there was a sense of this is easy money. And so part of that was that there was a discourse around piracy that wasn't just about economic deprivation. That, so we often don't see that, and, and you know, even sympathetic accounts that highlight the fact that, which I do as well, that there, there have been a series of ways in which international economic factors, the rise of certain kinds of fish consumption, fishing technologies, and just increasing violence at sea, pushed these people out, doesn't necessarily mean that you know, everyone then said, okay, then I'll be a pirate. There were also a whole host of other factors, and part of thinking about this ethnographically is highlighting that, is saying that these are, these are economies where you know, of all, like all kinds of, you know, work is always a morally contested category, and this is the same in Somalia. So in terms of everyday family structures, you know, most of my interactions with piracy came from being associated and located as someone who people thought was a merchant. They're like, well, who else would be interested in finding out about ships and their movements, either a spy or a merchant? And they're like, you look like you probably don't have enough money to be a spy, you don't have a satellite phone. <laughs> So they're like, you're a merchant. Then, you know, the South Asian, there are lots of South Asian merchants in Kenya. There's some in Somalia. And I speak Swahili as well as Somali. So they're like, well, a Swahili speaker, Indian who comes from Kenya, Indian merchant. So, so part of my interaction with this was people trying to reassure me that goods can still move in and out and how that happened. And initially, I resisted that because I wanted, you know, I was like, well, tell me about kinship. Tell me about, like, how did you get recruited into it? And then just realizing that and this is, I think, anthropology after a while. It's when you keep hearing this, this sort of relationship between trade and it was like, okay, so, like, let, yeah, let's talk about these cars and how does one bring a car in. And, and, and I think in that sense, you know, most of the sort of stories I heard were about just thinking about, you know, what does the ocean mean to us? Is it a space of, is it a space of connection? Is it a space that displaces us? There would be a lot of people who would wonder what it means that there are million dollar ships that just pass by our coast and, you know, we don't have access to that. So some of it was a kind of claim of, you know, of inequality globally and this is how it reflects itself. Others were also just about, I want to be a pirate because I cannot get married. I don't have enough money to be able to marry this person and I would like to do that. For many, it was a form of escape. It was a way of imagining a future outside of Somalia. And for some, it was, one was claimed not to be a pirate even though you just said I was just supplying people who happened to be pirates. So there was all, all of that in that for some it was adventure, but a lot of people also talked about seasickness because most of the people who went to sea were pastoralists and especially as piracy boomed in 2007, 2012. So, so repeatedly I heard stories of, I had no idea how terrible being at sea is. And like, you know, these skiffs are horrible, the waves are so high coming next to, like it just how disorienting being at sea is. And that's something I've been trying to write about in my work is just this encounter with the ocean is, is one of both hospitability but also inhospitality. Like because at the boat then you become friends, you create these things, I don't want to keep those stories because they matter. They matter to anyone who's spent time at sea. Right? We have recognized that there's something, there's an intimacy that develops, but there's also the sense of 
being alone and, and kind of trying to write about that and, and seasick pirates. <laughs> 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 Um, I'm wondering, as I think about, uh, we had a workshop on Ethiopia and Eritrea uh, at Howard University just a couple of weeks ago, um, and there the discussion was on uh, migration by sea, by land, by any possible means. Is there an element of, of migration of sea that you were exposed to as well? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because a number of these places, especially uh, in Puntland, are ports where Bosaso had boats that would go to Yemen. Some of the earlier pirates were people who had been working as human smugglers who then became pirates or moved back into human smuggling as well. So so a lot of so there's there's very much a kind of interlinking between these two economies. There are often people who think that if I don't become a pirate, hopefully I'll just get to cross the sea this way and get somewhere. And I think there's a similar, in terms of that idea of what the sea represents, there's a similar way in which it is this treacherous space to potentially a better future. So both metaphorically, but also act in terms of the, number, the people, but also the kinds of practices that were associated with going to boats. Some people would want to get captured by, hopefully, French navies, because there was a rumor at that point that if you did, you got asylum, and, which wasn't true. but. But so a number of people would just try and go out and say, we are pirates, and think that that meant that one would get asylum. And it doesn't, because you can't get asylum if you've been convicted of piracy or other <laughs> criminal activity. Uh, in the old system of privateering, the host government, I guess, would either commission or at least sanction the, the act of uh, privateering. Does that exist in today's piracy? In, if one thinks of licensing as an analog to it in the sense that if, so privateering in fact is a way to act, is a way I think about how private, the shipping, uh, the fishing companies see them, see their roles, right? We are, we are overfishing but we have a license so it's okay for us to do this and that license is essentially a, a piece of paper that sometimes was given 20 years ago by a, the Somali government and that still somehow means something. So, but there are, there, there are a whole host of ways in which the idea of licenses come up and passes and pass systems, so the Portuguese system, but also in current Somali piracy. So one of the things that numerous people have confirmed is that people would tell me that you know, we are, this is ethical because if a ransom is paid, this is an exchange, an ethical exchange, because a ransom is paid and then a ship isn't captured again. Like, you know, if this wasn't some, this, if this was just extracted, we would just capture the ship again and try, and, you know, try and get more money out of it. And so, and often it led to the creation of these passes that were given to ships. So if they were boarded again, they could, and some seafarers would say that that happened, that they would say, no, we've been hijacked before, and here's my pass, and we have, we have that protection. So that is very, that is akin to, at least this idea that there is some meaning of some kind of political authority attached to these papers, which is how I'm thinking of privateering in mm -hmm. that sense, not simply as state-sanctioned war through private means, which it was in the Atlantic, but rather this, this idea of certain kinds of licensed plunder versus unlicensed one, and that the presence of documents that, meet, that ends up creating these distinctions. But that pass would only be good uh, to the pirates who had raided that ship previously. Mm -hmm. But if it's a new group of pirates, I mean, th there isn't a code of honor among them. There, there were. There, there were was. some codes of conduct which included acknowledging each other's passes. Oh. Because that was one way of... Like, it was thought, and I think wrongly so, that there could be a way of creating a sort of a, a system that would be recognized and legible by the international community that this could just be a form of payment. And, and, and a lot of NATO officials, like when I, I did a ship transit from Djibouti down to Mombasa on one of these um, Navy vessels, and at dinner at one point the captain said, you know, like, well, you know, when we go through the Suez, the, there's the pilot boat that comes, 
and you all, everyone knows that you have a little envelope with cash for the pilot, and that's just this kind of gift that one does, and it's not accounted in our you know, shipping cost, but it exists. And, and he was like, you know, and sometimes I wonder why can't we just have a similar system for Somalia as opposed to paying a war risk fee or all of that. And then they would think about it and say, no, it's just not going to happen. There's just a way in which, and this is that sort of impossibility of certain kinds of actors don't get to do that. Only states get to do it or so, like, you know, and, what, and I'm interested in that question also of who gets to assert a claim of saying you owe me something and who doesn't. And, and pirates were seen, even though it would be far cheaper if you looked at just the numbers to pay off pirate groups than it would have been to go through this whole insurance negotiation process. But, but I think so, you know, when one talks about the costs of piracy, figures like a billion dollars a year get thrown around. But if you look at the costs of ransoms, they are never more than 100 million. So most of the costs of piracy are, in fact, the cost of increased insurance costs, the, the kinds of things that then get added to the cost of transit, including private security, like this person is making $50,000 for the transit, the costs of keeping Navy vessels at sea, which is somewhat disingenuous because Navy vessels would still you know, stay at be at sea if it wasn't for piracy. Did you see religion, uh, Islam as uh, having uh, a panacea against uh, piracy? They may not, uh, they may be one of the Muslims, uh, mm -hmm. which I believe majority. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Yeah, life is not actually directed by the tenants of Islam, which is against piracy. So if that, you know, uh, aspect to, is to be teased out, and the theory be kind of proven uh, that as well. You know, scholars should go public on this as against you know, what they do. Is there a hope? Yeah, they were certainly. I mean, both in the fact that not everyone became a pirate, but also in how one spent ransom money, whether it was okay to ransom. They were, and you know, one of the main reasons why a lot of people did not go into piracy was because they were familiar pressure saying, no, this is un Islamic, this is haram. But but there's also a certain pragmatics in which we all kind of inhabit, right? There's, there were attempts to say, well, but what if we don't attack Muslim shipping versus non-Muslim shipping? And, and then you realize that in the global shipping world, it's very difficult to tell, which because of flags of convenience and all of these other ideas, where and who actually, who the ship belongs to. And you know, there's a flag state, there is, but but that is not necessarily a really, you know, so most, sometimes it's Mongolia, and Mongolia does not, you know, does not have a very, not, not many great ports in Mongolia. <laughs> 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 it's, it's, it's around Uganda, which one, right. one, one wants mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And it's interesting, it can be interesting. Right, but that, and that is, that was certainly a major way in which many young people were brought back into the sort of whole, like, you know, gave up piracy, these kinds of public forms of forms that started. But I think there was that hesitation initially to say, well, you know, do we need to think about this as, you know, as always had happened? So people would be like, well, there are space, there is, you know, necessity, there are all of these ways in which one can imagine creating things that are not halal or haram and that they're even in Islamic but, but but I don't want to also think, you know, that make these people into theologians. They weren't like there was there was that, but there was also a certain form of the adventure, the idea that this is just temporary. I'll do this, then I'll go on Hajj, I will atone, and then I will get to the US. <laughs> yes. Um, do you do you know what percentage of ransoms are actually paid? And if a ransom is not paid, paid does that does that automatically mean debt to the captives? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily. So in terms of ransom payments, the time frame varies. And oftentimes what would happen if the ransom wasn't paid is after a few years, the ship would just be let go because it was very expensive keeping that ship hostage for 
know, in, in the expectation that there would be a ransom payment. Because part of it was, it was a very unpredictable form of, I mean, certain countries have different policies, U.S. flagships certainly never, you know, at least publicly never claim to pay ransoms. Other countries have uh, a different, you know, Spain does, so when Spanish fishing trawlers were hijacked, there was a large ransom that was paid almost immediately. And, and sometimes no one would be able to find out where a ship was from. So there were so many layers and kind of shell companies that controlled it, so by the time you you know, there were ships were abandoned, and that's one of the other stories of this is what happens when, and, and for crews, the former hostages who were sometimes stuck for three, four years would say, you know, it was both horrifying what the pirates did to me in terms of capture, but it was also horrifying to realize that this company that I've worked for 10 years just disappeared in this moment, and they didn't exist. And, and so in that sense, ransom payments were, were not there was no one-on-one -on -one correlation between you know, capture, phone call, ransom drop. It, and, and it's in that space of uncertainty that a whole host of things happen. Mm -hmm. Some good, some bad, violence. Mm -hmm. Not most of the deaths that happened initially, at least, were from medical complications suffered for crews. So a number of crew members would get heart attacks. And, and, it, and that's important. You know, this is not in any way meant to undervalue the sort of trauma of right. this. And, you know, to think of piracy as protection in all of these frames is not to deny that importance of thinking of the violence that is inherent in this, but also to sort of think about all the different kinds of violence and extraction that are central to this larger world that just is not just about piracy. Is the rate of murder high, though? Not, I mean, most of the people who were killed would be medical complications or some groups would have you know, would inflict violence and then not know what you know, the, the injuries and things like that. 